Welcome. We are going to get started with our event today. So um, hello and welcome. My name is Britt Robinson and I'm here representing the International Center for Research on Women. I want to thank all of you for joining us for our event on intersectionality, feminist, feminist solidarity, and digital organizing in Ghana today. For our event today, uh, it will consist of a presentation followed by a short Q&A session. So please feel free to use the chat features on the lower part of your screen to submit questions throughout the event. Now, uh, we at ICRW are so proud to have our 2022 Paula Cantor Award winner, Dr. Wunpini Mohammed, here with us to share her incredible research on this topic today. Dr. Mohammed is an assistant professor of global media at the University of Georgia. She's born and raised in Tamale, Ghana, and she completed her PhD in mass communications with a minor in women and gender and sexuality studies and African studies concentration at the Belisaro College of Communications at Pennsylvania State University. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Dr. Mohammed, to tell us about your research today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Britt. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you all for joining us um, here today. I'm very happy to be here to be uh, sharing my work. Um, and thanks to the ICRW team for bringing me on to talk about feminist organizing um, in Ghana. So today I'm going to um, bring attention to issues around feminist solidarities and digital organizing in Ghana, um, <clears throat> focusing specifically on how intersectionality and um, feminist accountability can be useful for understanding the I maybe haven't right, I'll just stop there and then share again. All right. So I'm going to begin by giving um, you know, a larger con the larger context for uh, feminist movements within the Ghanaian. Um, space, and I'd like us to go back in history to look at the ways in which gender advocacy and feminist organizing within the Ghanaian space was specifically sort of undermined by the various military regimes that the country of Ghana um, has been subject to. But in the last few decades, um, Ghana has been, um, you know, run on a democratic system, which means that there have been more freedoms as far as uh, feminist organizing is concerned. As we think about this too, it's important to understand that there has been, uh, you know, since the 2000s, an NGOization of, of women's groups, which means that they are often disconnected from the masses, and which also means that a lot of the time their work focuses on the mandate or, or you know, the desires of these uh, in, um, organizations <clears throat> that fund these NGOs. And then a lot of the activism that we are seeing very recently has focused on empowerment discourses, which can be useful, but which often tends to be uh, performative and uh, sort of individualistic, focusing on individuals and their achievements, rather than thinking about how collectively working to address the issues affecting women in Ghana can be achieved. And so as we think about empowerment, a lot of the discourses focus on the accomplishments of women, basically looking at women with high levels of education and who often work in, in the formal sector, without necessarily censuring issues affecting women who do not have these kinds of um, privileges or who don't espouse these types of identities. Um, so in today's talk, one of the things that I'll be paying attention to and using as a theoretical um, framework to understand the larger context of feminisms in Ghana is uh, intersectionality uh, and looking at it within the larger African context and also honing in specifically on Ghana to talk about the ways in which we can use this framework to improve feminist praxis within the country. So according to May, um, intersectionality sort of asks that we imagine future possibilities and reconsider missions past and present from a matrix, of, a matrix mindset. It also helps to expose historical silences. And I'm particularly interested in historical silences because as we discuss intersectionality, it's basically drawing our attention specifically within the African context to paying attention to the ways in which um, certain marginal identities are often not centered in the feminist agenda. So we are looking at 
um, issues affecting people with disabilities. We are looking at LGBTQI plus people. We are looking at um, people from low socioeconomic backgrounds, people from marginalized um, um, ethnic groups and marginalized religions among others. And so um, using this framework, it's important for us to understand how these historical silences um, sort of causes us to move away from understanding oppression and privilege and, and you know, lived experiences and how they're sort of situated within um, the Ghanaian national social material and political context and how that shapes the lives of these marginalized communities. In addition, um, in very in recent times, intersectionality has been very, very popular in, in um, conversations within the public sphere, um, also in the digital public sphere, specifically social media platforms such as Twitter, um, Facebook, or TikTok, and all of those spaces. And very often, it's uh, it can be misapplied um, in, in these spaces where, you know, a lot of the times when people talk about intersectionality, they just list off their various identities without making a strong connection between these identities and the structural systems within which these individuals um, find themselves or within which these individuals are situated. And uh, as we think about intersectionality too, it's important to think about the ways in which identities shift or are negotiated and renegotiated as individuals sort of navigate different geographical um, um, spaces. And so it's not just useful for understanding um, theory as far as research is concerned, but it's also useful for understanding how feminist organizing at the grassroots level, specifically within the global South, um, can be improved to sort of center the issues affecting marginalized communities within these spaces. And so um, in the Ghanaian context, as we think of intersectionality, we have to look at history. And I want us to go back to May's assertion of historical silences, right? So when we talk about historical silences and we discuss history, very often um, history is made and history, actually history is written um, by people who often occupy positions of power, which means that marginalized communities who have participated in the history making process are often um, excluded uh, from you know, the history um, um, and writing process. And so they are often written out. And so that's how we end up with these historical silences. And so in the Ghanaian context, let's think about um, you know, slavery and what that means for what identity looks like in Ghana today. Let's look at colonization and how that has shaped identity um, in, in Ghana today. And in our post-colonial reality, what does identity sort of look like? And I want us to connect colonization to the post-colonial reality because the, the issue I'm gonna talk about today, which is LGBTQI rights um, in Ghana, um, is situated within this larger context of colonization and our post-colonial reality, where colonial era laws has been, have been used to criminalize queerness, not just in Ghana, but in other parts of, of Africa and other parts of the world, um, specifically uh, British colonial um, laws. Now, uh, as we think about intersectionality too, it, historically, when discussions have been made about the feminist or gender activist or advocacy movement in Ghana, it has often centered on the woman category. And in, in this woman category, woman category, they're often thinking about colonial and binary conceptualizations of gender, which thinks about gender in male and female terms, rather than thinking about it more expansively. Um, interestingly too, a lot of our Ghanaian and African languages sort of are um, providing us with the resources to think more expansively about gender because in many of our languages, we do not have um, um, gendered pronouns. And so that's something to think about. And uh, it's also um, something that we can think of as we look to our own communities to find a radical uh, language to rearticulate the importance of um, expansively sort of thinking about um, gender. And of, of course, in, in this space too, there has historically and presently uh, been an erasure of the matrix of identities. And when I say matrix of identities, in the Ghanaian context, I'm looking, about, I'm looking at various identity categories such as gender, um, age, ethnicity, ethnicity, social class, religion, sexuality, and disability. Um, and I also emphasize age because as we look at, um, for example, in the Ghanaian context very recently, um, an older woman, a 90 year old woman was murdered because she was thought to be, um, you know, she was accused of, of witchcraft. And so there we see the intersectionality of gender and age to produce her lived reality and also the oppression to which she was subjected within that patriarchal um, um, sort of system. And you can even compare it to other 
for example, communities such as in, in, in Nepal, where um, um, Dalit women who are often sort of accused of, of witchcraft, you see the intersectionality of their caste identity um, and their, their gender identity to produce sort of the lived reality that they, they have. Uh, specifically today, I'll be focusing on sexuality and how that um, um, looks like within the Ghanaian context. And I'll be going in there to um, talk more about that. But as we move on, I want us to think reflexively about how um, African and Ghanaian social movements um, can learn from applying intersectionality to praxis. Because so far I've been talking about how we are seeing these historical silences and how we are seeing the ways in which oppression can manifest and the kinds of identities that are erased, not just from feminist organizing, but also from the Ghanaian public um, sphere. Now, uh, as we delve deeper into understanding gender sexualities and feminisms in Ghana, it's important to also think about the role of uh, non-governmental organizations in sort of re-entrenching this gender binary where their work often focus on um, issues affecting cisgender heterosexual women and virtually um, sort of disregarding um, um, sexual identities and also disregarding the, the notion that we can think about um, gender more expansively beyond that um, binary. And then even beyond that, we have seen recent scholarship by um, Constance Akugu, who has looked at the ways in which uh, gender performance looks like among the Dagaba um, of the Upper West region of Ghana and how we can look to that to understand what gender looks like or how gender can be conceptualized uh, within an indigenous sort of space um, in Ghana. And very recently, the scholarship that we have seen um, focusing on Ghana and Africa has also paid attention to the ways in which sexuality um, is sort of discussions around sexuality is shaped by culture and history. And that has also been useful for us to understand the current oppressions that queer and trans people are facing on the continent. Now, um, you know, we have also learned that there has been a marginalization of LGBT identities um, in LGBT identities in Ghana and also in other parts of the continent. And very often these kinds of marginalizations are driven by uh, the agenda of Christian religious discourses, specifically within the Ghanaian context where Christianity is the dominant religion. Um, Christian religious discourses and the power that Christian organizations sort of wield have often been weaponized to undermine efforts um, at uh, improving the lives or creating condi the conditions for queer and trans people to live uh, dignified lives within um, the Ghanaian context. And there've also been homophobic narratives in the media where uh, the Ghanaian media organizations, specifically news media organizations, who according to the Ghana Journalist Association's um, um, code of conduct should uh, report on stories in ways that do not discriminate against people based on all of these other identities and specifically sexuality, we're seeing that these media organizations are not following this code of conduct. So they are basically reinforcing homophobic narratives in the media um, that have often been harmful to, to queer and trans people in Ghana. And also we've seen in these narratives where queerness is sort of portrayed as an African um, or something that is foreign that is being imposed onto the African context. And this is not just unique to the Ghanaian context. We've seen that play out in, in other countries like Uganda. We've seen that play out in Nigeria and Kenya and other parts um, of the continent. And of course, there has been not a lot of scholarly work that focuses on LGBTQI plus identities and how it is specifically situated in the feminist um, um, scholarly agenda. Um, and beyond that too, more recently, in many parts of the continent, we are seeing um, a lot of pressure um, uh, from religious, you know, religious fundamentalist groups um, to sort of push for state state uh, sanctioned violence um, directed at queer and trans people in the country. So, as I thought about, as I thought about, you know, examining LGBTQI plus identities within the Ghanaian context, I sort of drew from Akinia and Abbas's conceptualization of the term here, where they use it to uh, denote a political frame rather than a gender identity or sexual behavior. And they also use it to underscore a perspective that embraces gender and sexual plurality and seeks to transform, overhaul, and revolutionize African order rather than seek to assimilate 
um, into oppressive heteropatriarchal um, capitalist frameworks. And this specific conceptualization has been useful for me to sort of understand the ways in which queerness and um, anti-queer rhetoric sort of manifest within the Ghanaian uh, context. Now, I just wanna provide a timeline um, to, to, to sort of help us understand where we are at in Ghana today as far as LGBTQI plus rights are concerned. So um, even before January 2021, there had been anti-queer rhetoric in the Ghanaian public sphere, and you can trace it back to so many utterances made by various um, um, you know, political figures within the country, some of which included presidents, and then also from various people who occupied various sectors of, of the Ghanaian space, such as you know, the legal sector, the health sector, and all of those. Um, but more recently, last year in, in January, LGBT Rights Ghana, which is a, a queer advocacy organization, opened a community center in Accra to sort of provide a space for queer and trans people to safely sort of commune um, and to have community to support each other. Um, and in February, you know, following a public, the publicization of the opening in February, um, state sanctioned violence was sort of um, visited on the space and it was shut down um, um, by the police. And then in July, you know, you know, even before in July and May, there were, um, you know, an, there was an arrest of 21 um, activists who were detained for several weeks um, for organizing a workshop that sort of provided resources on reproductive health and reproductive rights um, um, in the Volta region. Um, and then following that in July, we saw that they presented um, an anti-gay bill before parliament. And it's also important to understand that this specific bill was, um, you know, there have been connections that have been made between the bill and the work that evangelical organizations here in the US are doing who often sponsor anti-queer um, sort of organizations within the continent and provide them with the resources to push bills such as this that is currently um, before parliament. So 2021 is very critical um, for understanding what is currently happening in Ghana right now. And following all of these things that have happened in the presentation of the anti-gay bill before parliament, there have been numerous reports of um, um, violence targeted at queer presenting or, or queer people within the Ghanaian um, um, space. So now, before we go into you know, the crux of the issue, I want to look at the ways in which I use an African feminist sort of critical discourse analytical framework to understand the way that language was used to um, support queer rights or to condemn um, um, the support of queer rights. So I thought about language and ideology and power and how they were situated in the discourses that were happening within the Ghanaian context. And I definitely also drew from my own experiences as an organizer and as a scholar within the Ghanaian feminist space to help me sort of provide a larger context to understand what was happening um, within the country. And so in order to look more critically at what was happening in Ghana, I wanted to um, examine the ways in which various feminist and gender advocacy organizations um, were standing in solidarity with the queer and trans community in the country. So I looked at statements from the Young Feminist Collective uh, which was established, I believe, in 2018, the Ark Foundation uh, and Net Rights, which were both established in 1999, and the Coalition of Domestic Violence Le Legislation in Ghana, which was also sort of revamped in, in 2018. A lot of these statements were released on social media platforms like WhatsApp and um, um, Facebook and all of those other spaces. So I paid attention to these um, statements to see the ways in which language was used to entrench power within this um, socio-political space. And some of the things that I found were very interesting. So one of the major things that I found by paying close attention and closely analyzing these um, solidarity statements was that the dominant narrative in many of the statements were um, the notion of debating the humanity of LGBTQI plus people, which actually is not very different from the current sort of dominant discourse around LGBT rights in um, Ghanaian media and in the Ghanaian public sphere where there has been you know, a huge focus on debating the humanity of queer and trans people. So for example, um, Net, in, in, in Net Rights statement, they sort of created room to debate the humanity of queer and trans people through the use of language. So um, for example, in this specific extract, you'll see I've underlined whose opinions we may disagree with. So here they've sort of presented 
these kinds of um, um, you know, identities as um, um, opinions that people could agree or disagree on rather than as human rights that should be um, um, unequivocally sort of um, um, supported. And then one of the things that I also found was that they, in, in, the, in the debate, like in the debating of the humanity of LGBTQI plus people, I saw that they were reducing queer and trans people to sexual activities. So rather than humanizing them, them and talking about them as humans, they were talking about the promotion of LGBT plus activities, which was sort of code for um, sexual intercourse. And then you also see that in um, this specific statement, they also talk about how the members of the organization do not agree um, on the current constructions of, of gender identities and basically saying they didn't agree on the humanity of queer and trans people. And so what I found, especially with these two extracts that I pulled from is that these two organizations sort of uh, labeled or identified as um, gender advocates, uh, mostly um, as opposed to feminists. And I also found that there was some solidarity, there was some solidarity that was happening, you know, beyond the two um, organizations that I looked at whose statements sort of reinforced harm um, as far as queer and trans rights are concerned, there was some solidarity that was um, um, happening uh, within the Ghanaian space, which I'll talk about um, quite soon. Um, but there were also generational tensions as I looked at the statements and sort of paid attention to the values of each of these organizations and how they emerged from the statements that they published. So for example, I found that um, this specifically was you know, historic because it was the first instance of mainstream advocacy organizations speaking in support of LGBTQI plus rights even if they did it um, you know, counterproductively, especially with the two statements that I talked about. Very often organizations like that just pretend that you know, um, LGBTQI plus rights are not, are not on the agenda and they do not speak on those issues at all. And then I also found that very often in, in those statements, older Ghanaian feminists and gender ad advocates sort of, um, the work that they did did not really um, pay attention to the usefulness or the utility of intersectionality for understanding identity, um, which I'll talk about soon. And there was also uh, in, in these two um, older organizations a detachment from the marginalized groups that they were purporting to solidarize with. So they would use language like they and there to sort of uh, show that they were not included in that category um, and to sort of detach themselves from um, the queer and trans community in Ghana. And then um, another thing that I sort of paid attention to was solidarity and generational tension. So as far as solidarity is concerned, the Young Feminist Collective, which is a young feminist group um, in the country, um, they did interesting work in use of language um, to show solidarity. So they publicly named and shamed the people involved in, in, the re in the entrenchment of violence toward queer and trans people, unlike other organizations which did not <clears throat> name or shame any specific group. So for example, the YFC specifically directly addressed um, um, the president by saying that the president's silence was approval of violence directed at queer and trans people. So you saw that they made a speech act here specifically to um, directly sort of um, call attention to the president's inaction that was leading to more and more violence directed at this community. And they also explicitly sort of asserted an intersectional uh, identity. So they said that, you know, they grounded their political work in an intersectionality framework. And so you could see that in, the pra in their praxis through their use of language in the statements that um, they were doing. So this young feminist organization sort of espoused an intersectionality framework and was more direct in the, the solidarity that they were doing and was more firm in their support of queer and trans communities. But you saw that the other two, um, um, you know, the other older organizations didn't really do that. Interestingly, too, there were also younger feminist organizations that um, um, supported anti-queer rhetoric um, in their solidarity um, um, statements. So it's really complicated to look at generational tensions. And even following that, we also noticed that a lot of the um, people, you know, there was a lot of solidarity from people from across the spectrum. Um, for example, Silent Majority Ghana um, came up with a statement and over 1,200 Ghanaians signed um, the statement. So that showed that there was still a lot of solidarity from the Ghanaian public um, with the queer and trans community, but the people, especially the opinion leaders who had a lot of power, often um, were 
espousing anti-queer sort of um, um, rhetoric or anti-queer stances as far as LGBTQI plus identities are concerned. Interestingly, too, we saw some older um, um, feminists come out in, in support of the queer and trans community and using their ethos and their platforms and going on national television to express support for um, these groups. So it's really complicated as we think about generational tensions. It wasn't always that younger feminists were more progressive than older feminists. Younger feminists could also espouse more conservative values as far as queer and trans identities are concerned. And older feminists, some older feminists were also um, radical in their support of the queer and trans community in the country. So one of the things that I found um, as I looked at all of these statements and contextualized it within the Ghanaian space was that a lot of these um, statements that were reinforcing harm toward the queer and trans community, many of them were doing it because they desired sort of mainstream approval. Um, so because of that, they sort of, um, it, it, it undermined their ability to um, use intersectionality in the practices that they were doing. And then as I reviewed scholarship on the work too, I noticed that there's not a lot of work within the Ghanaian and even in the African context that has paid a lot of attention to um, feminist accountability and intersectionality as useful frameworks for understanding um, gender identity and, and sexuality within this specific context. But it's important to note that there has been some scholarship in the past that has um, espoused this specific sort of um, intersectionality identity, um, but that has probably not necessarily used that language. And it's sort of similar to the case here in the US where even though intersectionality was coined in 1989 by Kimberly Crenshaw, um, uh, the Combahe River Collective were already, you know, theorizing and also sort of organizing around an intersectionality praxis even before the language was coined. So it's important to take note of that. And it's also imperative for us to pay attention to how a praxis of accountability can be useful for sort of addressing these generational tensions and, and that, that we're seeing in the, these spaces, not just in Ghana, but also on the continent. And so as we think about solidarity and solidarizing with marginalized communities, it's important to move away from perpetrating harm, even if inadvertently, to sort of intentionally exhibiting solidarity like the Young Feminist Collective did. Also pulling from intersectional and feminist accountability frameworks can help to sort of fill the gaps in, in the lack of literature within the space. And adopting intersectionality and feminist accountability as praxis too can be useful. And I'm particularly interested in feminist accountability because feminist accountability helps us to understand marginalization, um, not just you know, as it pertains to others and to ourselves, but it helps us understand marginalization and how, um, I, I, the, how we can think about the mutuality as far as identity conceptualization is concerned and how oppression or various kinds of oppressions are interconnected because they are all created under the larger umbrella of the patriarchy. Now, as we wrap up, I would like us to think about what um, social movements can, can learn from conceptualizing um, from a matrix of identities, how African feminist movements can show solidarity with marginalized communities through international and transnational collaborative networks, because that's important because the issues that we are thinking about as far as oppression is concerned is not just limited to the African content, uh, context or the national context, but they are connected globally as we make connections between them and colonization and imperialism. Also, how can we all as, as feminist activists and scholars sort of incorporate um, uh, accountability and intersectionality in the organizing and scholarship um, that we do. And so um, I just want to wrap up by saying that uh, the work that I presented today is based on uh, my published articles. The first one is called Feminist Accountability, which was the base of today's presentation, um, published in Communication, Culture and Critique Journal. And the second one was uh, Why We Need Intersectionality in Ghanaian Feminist Politics and Discourses, which was also published this year in the Feminist Media Studies Journal. Thank you so much. And um, I can't wait to have a conversation with you as we grapple with some of the questions that you may have.
Thank you so much. I think I speak for everyone in saying that your presentation was phenomenal and also so timely. Uh, this is a conversation I've had a lot with our staff at ICRW as well about how LGBTQ plus individuals are left out of so much research, especially in the feminist movement and with gender. So I am really excited to see what questions people have. Uh, please use the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen to put forth any questions. Um, and we do have a few that we've collected. So to get us started, um, let me take a look at the list. All right. So what do you feel are the critical next steps for the movement to counter marginalization and lifting up intersectionality? Um, so I'm just going to talk specifically about the Ghanaian context. And I think that right now, some of the things that we need um, within the Ghanaian context is um, collaboration. So we're not seeing a lot of collaboration among um, feminist or gender advocacy organizations. And so we need more of that, not just within the Ghanaian context, but also transnationally. So what can Ghanaian feminists learn from say, um, Black American feminists, what can Ghanaian feminists, um, or what can Kenyan feminists learn from Ghanaian feminists? Because that's what, um, you know, collaboration looks like. And that's what solidarity also looks like. You know, there's this mutuality where you can learn from me and I can learn from you. And so we need more of that. And I feel like right now within Ghana and in many African feminist spaces, many of these organizations seem to be siloed and seem not to interact with each other. And so if we are working for collective liberation and we are not working with each other or seeing where there are gaps and working to fill those gaps, it's difficult um, for the movement to move forward. And another thing that I think that we can do specifically in Ghana is that a lot of these um, gender advocacy and feminist organizations are often based in Accra, which is the capital of Ghana. And that means that a lot of the work that they do sort of focus disproportionately on Accra. And so people in other parts of the country, specifically, for example, in the northern part of the country, marginalized communities in those parts of the country are often left out of the conversation. And that also means that if we're going to have a collective liberation, there has to be a mass movement for that to happen. So if you're focusing on just one specific location without galvanizing support at the grassroots level across the nation, um, there's not gonna be a lot of movement that's going to be happening in this regard. Yes, I think that's, it's really important and it's very difficult to connect all of these different spaces. Um, what do you feel is the role of the media, both traditional media and social media, in in solving this issue that you've talked about of connecting all of these people, but also changing um, cultural perspective? So I think the media has a critical role to play because currently the media in Ghana and also in other parts of the world are um, complicit in, in reinforcing violence toward queer and trans people. So for example, um, you'll see a news story that says, Oh, the chief psychiatrist of Ghana says that queerness or LGBTQI plus identities uh, are as a result of mental illness. And the media just repeats this without actually fact checking it or, you know, trying to sort of interrogate or challenge these very um, false sort of perspectives that are being shared that have been disproved over and over again. Um, and I also think that we need more implementation of certain policies. So for example, in Ghana, we have a GJ, the Ghana Journalists Association, they have a code of conduct that journalists are supposed to follow. And in the code of conduct, it says that in your work, do not discriminate against um, queer and trans people, right? Um, against people based on sexuality, gender, all of that, there's a whole list. But we are seeing them discriminate, the media discriminate against these communities. And there's actually, an organization by journalists in Ghana that calls themselves Journalists Against LGBTQI something, uh, which is currently, which is operating in the country. And there is no, there are no efforts by, for example, the Ghana Journalists Association or the National Media Commission or any of these organizations that have policies that explicitly state that journalists, especially in their work, cannot discriminate against these people. So we are seeing that there are policies that protect um, these protected classes, but they are not being implemented, right? Um, and so we need more of that to happen. And we also need more feminist journalism in our newsroom. So the issue is not just, you know, and I've, in, in the scholarship that I've done, there has been a, a lot of um, reinforcement of, of uh, violence and media representations um, 
focusing on LGBTQI plus communities, but it's not unique to that community. We see um, a reinforcement of, of violence as far as reporting on sensitive issues are concerned. So sometimes, for example, when there is a rape or someone has been raped or someone has been lynched, for example, um, and I, I think I mentioned it earlier in the in the in the presentation. Um, in in 2020, I believe a 90 year old woman was lynched um, because she was accused of witchcraft. And in most of the stories in Ghana, they used a still image of the video of her lynching in, in the stories and most of those stories. So they were further dehumanizing this um, um, victim of, of gender-based violence. And so this is how they were complicit in, in reinforcing violence. And we're also seeing that the regulatory frameworks or the regulatory sort of commissions are not doing their work to hold these organizations accountable and say, you cannot you know, re-traumatize the family of this victim. You cannot further dehumanize this victim by using this still image of her in this very you know, um, awful position in your news story. So the media is definitely complicit, even though it purports to be objective in, in news reporting. So do you think there's space um, in Ghana for NGOs to step in and provide training or hold these organ media organizations accountable? Or is this something you feel the government needs to be involved with in terms of policy and implementation? I think that we need to look at it holistically. There is definitely space and there are organizations that are doing work. So for example, the CDD Ghana, Center for Democratic Development Ghana, um, the Alliance for Women in Africa Ghana, um, all of these are organizations that are doing work to provide like um, sensitization and training on these issues. Um, Ghana Fact is also a fact checking organization that is providing training for journalists so that they don't sort of um, perpetrate fake news in their journalism by just saying what, let's say a minister tells them, even if it's an inaccurate without saying this is actually false, right? So there is space in the civil society sector and people are already doing the work in that sector. But I think we also need to look at it holistically. The problem is not just at the newsroom level, but it's also at the level of education. In, in um, our journalism institutions, we, don't, we haven't done enough work to in, in, you know, sort of establish our pedagogy to educate uh, journal, journalism students to sort of think more critically about ethics in reporting, you know, the ethics of reporting, how to um, you know report sensitively um, you know report on sensitive issues and all of that. So at the educational level, we need to do that. Also at the political level too, we need to see um, implementation happen. We need to also see that there is accountability happen. So for example, we have the laws, but when they are broken by media organizations, very often we are not seeing them being held accountable. In other spaces, often they'll be held accountable by being fined or by being given a warning, or you know, by being made to face some sort of disciplinary um, um, commission. But I don't think that the implementation framework is as robust currently as it needs to be. Yeah, and to follow to follow up on that, um, so in South Korea, uh, homosexuality is condemned within the constitution. Um, that's a very general overview, but yes. And so their uh, LGBTQ organizations and NGOs are not allowed to become NGOs to get that registration status. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, how does this work in Ghana? Like with the government, are they condemning these organizations? Are they able to function? What does that look like? I mean, um, we don't really have a law that criminalizes, um, that explicitly criminalizes queerness in Ghana. That's why there is an anti-gay bill before parliament, but there are definitely frustrations when organizations like LGBTQI plus organizations try to get registered and be recognized as NGOs. I know that they're definitely going to be faced with a lot of roadblocks if they try to. And so some organizations or, you know, activist groups have tried to find a way to sort of organize within this very constricted space. But I believe that if, if that bill passes into law, it's going to be virtually impossible for them to do the work that they're currently doing to provide resources for, for these communities. And so um, that's why it's important for more and more Ghanaians to speak up against um, um, the passing of the bill into law. And just for context, <laughs> the bill has been described as one of the most um, homophobic or queerphobic bills to ever see the light of day. So for example, 
if you know that someone is queer and you do not report them, you're you're gonna get in trouble. You could be persecuted for that. Um, if you provide health services to queer people, you're gonna get in trouble. Like there's so many things. And if you are an ally or if you <laughs> purport to be an ally of the queer community, you could be thrown in jail. So even beyond criminalizing um, queerness for queer and trans people, all of the support systems that they may get from you know, reproductive and health spaces, from family and social units, from religious spaces, all of these other spaces are being constricted in a way that they are going to be left with virtually no support um, um, to survive in, in, in this community because not just their identities are criminalized, but support of them as individuals is criminalized. It is, is yeah. That actually leads perfectly into our next question um, from Matthew Nyabi. Do you see Ghanaian culture and religious stances as a strong opponent to the movement of gender and sexuality? I do. Um, I think that the current anti-gay bill before parliament is definitely being pushed by um, religious organizations in Ghana, mostly Christian religious organizations. And more recently, we are seeing Muslim um, religious organiz organizations sort of showing support in this regard. Um, and it's also interesting because a lot of these religious organizations are often you know, saying that, you know, the, 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 the thing that they're using to support this anti-queer rhetoric is that it's not Ghanaian, um, but others have argued that, you know, Christianity and Islam are also not, they are not African, they are an African, they were imported into Africa, right? So it's really interesting to see all of that. And definitely they are the ones leading the charge in, um, in, in this. And so the bill is called something like the proper human values bill, which is very similar to the language that we see here, family values and all of that that we see in conservative spaces here in the US. And very often to these Christian organizations are supported, not just logistically, but also with the language to, to push this kind of bill forward by American evangelical um, organizations. There's been a lot of, you know, um, um, you know, there have been a lot of news stories, feature articles, and I think um, journal articles that have made these strong connections. So in continuing on the importing of these, you've spoken on how uh, colonialism and Christian Catholicism mm -hmm. uh, has imposed binary and homophobic standards throughout the country. Um, how was it, I'm reading this question one second, how was it or is it before um, these, before Christianity came into Ghana, how was it before? Is there still memory among the people of the values prior to Christian importation? Right. Um, there's definitely, like, so earlier I talked about how many, many, many African and Ghanaian languages do not have gender pronouns. And I often tell people that um, when we learn English in schools and as a second language or even a first language, because, um, you know, we learn it once we start school in kindergarten and everything, in addition to our um, indigenous languages, very often the common mistakes that we do is misgendering people. Like you'll be talking about someone who identifies as a man and you'll be saying she, because we don't have that in the language, in our first languages, right? And so the fact that we don't have gender pronouns in our languages creates room for us to think about gender expansiveness within the Ghanaian context, pre-colonization, and even in the current context, because we still don't have gendered pronouns in our languages today. Like in, in my first language, Dagwani, we don't have any gendered pronouns, right? Um, so that helps us expansively look at that. But there has been documented evidence of the existence of queerness among various communities in Ghana and in other parts of the world. So for example, people have talked about um, queerness among the Nzima of Ghana, um, you know, in communities in the Northern region, um, for example, in the Upper West region um, and then uh, in the Upper West region of Ghana and also uh, there's an ethnic group in that region, the Dagaba of the Upper West region. Also, we have the Dagaba in Burkina Faso who we share about this with. Among that community, historically, um, queerness was sort of um, um, documented or, or part of the community or the way of life, right? Um, and in other places too, for example, in Northern Nigeria, pre-colonization, pre there was that and among the Nuer of Sudan, we had um, exist the existence of queerness within those communities. And even in Eastern Africa, we can think about woman to woman marriages where women marry women um, for various reasons, right? So we have always had that historically. 
but it was when colonization came in, it was used to sort of bastardize and demonize um, our ways of being that were sort of contrary to Christian um, um, values in these ways. But that is also not to say that there was no anti-queer sort of um, feelings or anti-queer constructions in some Af African communities. It was there. So both did coexist. So it doesn't mean that Africans did not support queerness at all. There were people who were, there were communities that were anti-queer and there were definitely a number of communities, significant number of communities that um, created the conditions for queerness to be a part of the way of life. That's that's fascinating. And um, I'll just say my own background is in China and Korea, and I speak those languages also do not have um, pronouns. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, um, is this is such a huge conversation in the West. Is it a conversation at all in Ghana or is it just there's there's no talk about pronouns, but the 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 issue comes out in other ways within the culture? I think that. The fact that uh, we don't have gendered pronouns is a way of life. It's so commonplace and banal that it's not even something that we think about or even like theorize or talk about. Um, but for example, uh, Dr. Constance Akrugu of the SD Dumbo um, University, in her scholarship, she has looked at beyond pronouns, um, she has looked at the notion of gender performativity. And when we talk about um, becoming a woman, people are often thinking about people like, um, Simone de Beauvoir, and they're thinking about the West and all of these spaces. But Dr. Akrugu looks at the ways in which um, femininities are constructed, negotiated, and renegotiated among um, traditional communities or indigenous communities in rural areas of the country. It's not like just looking at like urbanites or Afropolitans to see how they what they think about queerness and all of that. She's looking to the language and the existence of certain concepts within the language to um, demonstrate the ways in which gender is a performance um, in our own um, cultures, right? How women perform gender, and if they perform it in a particular way, they are labeled as this kind of woman, and if they perform it in a, in a different way, they are labeled as something different. Um, and I think that she has demonstrated in her scholarship that there is so much potential that um, our indigenous knowledge systems and our communities hold for thinking about the notion of human rights, thinking about the notion of um, gender and queer identities, um, to sort of make it less of a thing that, you know, to, to sort of not just counter the notion that it's a Western import, but to sort of understand how um, queerness and queer identities have historically and presently are situated within our communities and why it's important for us to sort of look to those conceptualizations of gender performance or performativity and my identity to be able to sort of look to a future. Because I think that, and I, I, I like that way of thinking because that means that if you are pulling from the culture to understand gender, it means that um, a lot of people within that culture will be committed to that sort of conceptualization. So then you can involve like community members, then you can involve chiefs and say, look, we have this in our community, we have this in our language and us thinking about calling a woman this because of the way she performs performative, like her femininity is telling us about what gender identity looks like and the potential to sort of think more expansively about gender. Fantastic. I, I want to read this work myself. It sounds so, so interesting. Um, and just everyone, we just have a few more minutes before we wrap up. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat. We're going to just take a few more. So um, our next one we have here is, can you describe a little in a more detail how you define accountability and feminist accountability? And what does this behavior look like? So <laughs> how I think of feminist accountability is, because a lot of the times when we talk about accountability, people are thinking about before I even go to that, like when it comes to accountability, there are a lot of fragile egos, right? Um, people don't like to be held accountable. But feminist accountability sort of thinks of accountability in a way that examines how, for example, um, the mutuality that exists as far as oppression is concerned. So if I'm oppressed as a Black woman and um, somebody else is oppressed as like a working class man, we can understand that our um, oppressions are operating or exist within a larger patriarchal system. So there is that sort of mutuality 
in, in, in the ways in which our oppressions sort of manifest. And so with feminist accountability, I think that, in, and in many feminist spaces too, one of the things that we have often not shied away from is having tough conversations um, and is disagreeing, you know, there's a lot of disagreement happening in feminism, and that is, and it's perfectly fine because that create room, that creates room for growth, right? Um, a lot of people think about dis disagreements and like discord as something that breaks apart movements, and it shouldn't really, because it's from that that we grow. And as we think about accountability, um, I also connect it to the notion of allyship, because when people think about allyship, they're like, well, I'm supporting your community, and if I make a mistake, it's your duty to correct me in a nice and sweet tone, right? Rather than focusing on the harm and how to undo the harm, we are focusing on the feelings of people who may have perpetrated harm in some way and who occupy, who may occupy positions of privilege um, as far as, you know, perpetrating these kinds of harms are concerned. Um, so for me, in, in, when we're doing feminist accountability, it's basically saying that this is what a particular organization is doing or this is what somebody is doing that could be improved on, and that could sort of help us build our movement toward what we want it to be. Because, um, and one of the things that can be very useful as far as accountability is concerned is to sort of depersonalize feelings. Because sometimes when somebody does harm and then they're, people are trying to say, oh, this is how we can undo that, or you know, not perpetrate this kind of harm, there is the feeling that there is an attack on the individual rather than on their action or the thing that they're doing, right? Um, and I believe that, you know, in the organizing that we have done, we've tried to sort of um, move away from that. So how I have done it has been, you know, in, in my, my work has been to sort of hold people accountable in the ways that they may not necessarily be paying attention to. So for example, as we think about queerness within the Ghanaian space, um, there have been discussions that are happening all over the place. And we're seeing that there are certain historical silences that are further sort of amplified. So for example, a lot of the organizing on queerness focuses on Accra and other parts, we don't see that really happening in other parts of the country, or we don't see Accra-based organizations trying to connect with other organizations in other parts of the country um, to support or to collaborate, to learn from them. Rather, sometimes we see them just like saying, well, this is what we're doing and it has to be able to apply to the whole of the country rather than looking at how we can specifically sort of customize these kinds of solutions to the sociocultural context that we're looking at. So uh, for me, feminist accountability is sort of focused on not further perpetrating harm, it's focused on undoing harm. And it also moves away from an egoistic um, approach to um, organizing where um, people often um, have hurt feelings over something. Because some, sometimes the person who is correcting you may be, the next time it, you may be the one correcting them. So that's when the mutuality also sort of comes to play there. I think that's great advice for all of us to take, especially as we move forward in this space and continue to have these conversations. And so to wrap us up um, for today, my last question for you is what's next? Where do you see yourself taking this research and moving forward? Yeah, so a lot of the scholarship that I have done has focused. So when people ask me, my research agenda is interested in media and power and marginalization. Um, so my work focuses on making connections um, between like, you know, connections as far as structural violence is concerned. So today I'm looking at um, violence directed at a queer and trans community. The next day, I may be looking at violence as it targets like older women, as far as let's say witchcraft accusations and things like that are concerned. And it's important for me to make these connections because people often think that queer and trans identities and activisms are something that is external to the gender and um, um, feminist movement in Ghana, but all of the violence that they face is under the same patriarchal violence that other communities like a uh, disabled community or, you know, um, um, working class people, um, you know, older women who are accused of witchcraft and all of that are subjected to. So I'm interested in sort of drawing these larger connections on how um, structural violence sort of produces the lived reality of people of varying identities.
I am looking forward to see where you go. Uh, need to follow you on all of your social media and everything to make sure I can keep up. And I encourage everyone to do the same. So with that, I want to thank you so much for just your incredible presentation and your research and being a part of this. Um, as our award winner this year, uh, thank you everyone who was able to come and attend and ask questions today. And we have recorded this, so I believe it will be going up somewhere in the ether um, in the next few days. So thank you all for attending and we hope to see you YouTube. Thank you, Joe. It'll be up on YouTube. Um, and we hope to see you at our next event.